Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of uh, Expert Insights. Today, we've got Alexi and Jack, and we're talking about quantum machine learning for finance. Uh, so while the session is just starting out, uh, have a read at the ticker at the bottom. It says, add in hashtag packed to ensure that you win a copy for yourself and you enter the raffle. Uh, and yeah, if you have any queries, please feel free to add them in the comments. I can see a lot of people have started adding in comments. Uh, but great, keep on adding more and more comments to ensure that you are one of the people who gets picked for the ebook. So welcome, Jack. Welcome, Alec Alexi. How have you been? Very good, thank you. Hello, everyone. Great. Uh, so Alexi, while we are waiting for others to join in and ask their queries, I have one. Why not start with something uh, and something really basic? Well, there's nothing basic when it comes to quantum, but what do you think, uh, what do you both think are the skill sets that one requires to work with quantum financial modeling in their team? Well, uh, I would say that um, a physics background would definitely help, uh, but it's not a must. You should mm -hmm. clearly understand that in order to uh, to be involved in quantum computing and do some interesting stuff uh, with uh, quantum hardware or maybe on the quantum simulators one doesn't have to be a, a physicist a professional physicist uh, what is needed uh, probably is uh, some basic programming skills inevitably because we want to do some experiments some numerical experiments we want to write some programs uh, what uh, what is also needed is some uh, basic understanding of, um, say, first year mathematics, uh, standard university course on linear algebra or something, uh, vectors, matrices, some basic operations, and uh, uh, a lot of interest for the subject. Uh, everything else can be picked up. And uh, it, it actually a motivation for our book. And today, I think we're going to talk uh, often about our book on uh, quantum machine learning and optimization in finance, that someone with a keen interest in quantum computing and quantum machine learning, and uh, hopefully in finance as well, uh, can pick up uh, uh, basic knowledge of quantum mechanics quite easily to the, to the extent needed uh, to write first programs, uh, first algorithms to implement uh, first models in uh, quantum computing and quantum machine learning. So I would say, um, any, anyone uh, who had one, two years of um, higher education um, and uh, knows a little bit of programming, uh, ideally in Python, but doesn't have to be Python. And, and here we can also mention another excellent book by Pact, uh, which uh, I enjoy very much, uh, uh, Python Machine Learning, which would be probably also a good book to have. So our book should come probably together with uh, Python machine learning, I would mm. say. Right. So just to give everyone a heads up, uh, I'll just show you the book that Alexi and Jack have written. Uh, this is the book that Alexi and Jack have written. And this is what we are talking about right now. Uh, so yeah, I think you've answered one of the questions already, by the way. Uh, Sarajit asks on LinkedIn, which programming language is relevant here? And Alexei, yes. I think we've already mentioned that. So maybe, so just to bring some, I mean, on this question and uh, your question, just to add mm -hmm. a, one little thing to mention. So the, the book originally came because so we started teaching a course, uh, Alexei and I, in the MSc Math Finance in Imperial College, uh, where we, we thought, oh, it would be a good idea to add a course on quantum computing within the program. And so the book and the course was designed for students who have basically a strong background in, I would say, math in general, uh, meaning mathematics, analysis, statistics, uh, extremely important. Um, and we developed the course and the book for that kind of students. And so, you know, in my view, you know, the skills for people in let's say, quantum finance, uh, I don't think there's a there's a precise terminology or accepted terminology yet, whether it's quantum computing finance, quantum finance, uh, financial quantum. Um, it's 
in the end, the people will work in finance, so they need to know some finance. Uh, they need to know, I would say, the important part, but of course, I'm biased uh, being in the math department, but they need to know core math, analysis, statistics, uh, some programming. And mm -hmm. Python is one of the most important languages uh, these days. It's used everywhere. And now there are some very nice uh, Python libraries for, for quantum computing. And of course, you know, it goes without saying that an interest in the topic, but I the physics part, in my view, and I say that you know, not coming from physics, but coming from math, physics part is less important. It's important as you know, intellectual curiosity to know where things are coming from. But in order to start implementing, let's say, quantum neural network, uh, to yeah. implement them, to understand them, to use them, somehow one does not need really too much physics. Uh, of course, understanding physics is important. Uh, mm. But one needs to know very well, well, have a good understanding of classical statistics, whether yeah. it's machine learning or not, but fundamental core statistics, math, numerical analysis, and programming. And I would say programming here, the most important would be Python. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, uh, so, Jack, you, you actually started answering the next question. And uh, you went back to the first one, so I, I will put up the second question here. So Houston actually inquired on LinkedIn, what should come first, uh, quantum encryption, even if it's just the mathematics of it, or uh, readers trying to figure out working with a quantum computer? So I would say, I'm, so I'm not a physicist, right? So mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand a little bit how hardware works. Um, but for example, if I switch so if I work in a, I don't know, a bank or hedge fund implementing quantum algorithms, I'm not going to build the hardware. Mm. So I'm not going, I think it's good to understand what, what superconducting qubits are, what photonics are and so on, but I'm not on the hardware side. I trust all the people that will build a quantum computer, and but I need to know a bit how that works in the sense that if I develop an algorithm, I need to understand maybe how the qubits are connected on how, what right. graph, uh they're using to um, to connect their qubits so I, I need to know a bit about it but if i'm if really i work on the applied side of it uh and quantum finance for example then math should come first because mm -hmm. in the end you work in finance mm -hmm. everybody uses models and you have to understand the models that already exist uh so the numerical part the stochastic part of them in order to improve them or to to propose an alternative. If you don't already know the, the models and how they perform, then mm -hmm. then there's a problem, right? You don't want to reinvent the wheel and restart everything from scratch. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of comments coming in, and thank you everyone for posting your uh, comments and queries. Keep adding them in, and we will try to get as many as possible answered. So Akila has inquired uh, how this can be integrated with AI. Uh, I think this is a great, great question. And actually, it's the title of our book. Uh, uh, because um, uh, high performance computing and AI or machine learning, they come together. right? We, we, cannot, we cannot even se start separating them. Inevitably, mm -hmm. they have to come together and uh, we consider it together. Uh, so think about. Uh, quantum computing as uh, any, any other type of high performance computing. Um, and think about applications, successful applications of machine learning, uh, whether it's uh, uh, discriminative models or generative models uh, or any, any kind of um, uh, sophisticated deep neural networks and so on and so on. Everything can be implemented efficiently on uh, quantum hardware. Clearly, uh, algorithms are different uh, uh, because uh, as, uh, classical computers and quantum computers operate uh, differently. Uh, there are massive differences. But in terms of um, um, AI, machine learning, uh, absolutely. And, and I would even say that 
in uh, quantum computing, there is a whole range of uh, you know, algorithms, very, very useful algorithms. Some of them uh, will become productive uh, later on, in five years, 10 years, maybe 20 years, you don't know, because they require extremely powerful uh, quantum computers with error correction. Uh, and so, so now we simply don't have a hardware on which we can run them. At the same time, there is a class of um, uh, quantum machine learning models or algorithms uh, that can be efficiently run, executed on existing uh, quantum hardware, which we call uh, NISC, noisy intermediate scale quantum hardware. Mm. Uh, algorithms that are somewhat resistant to noise, uh, where we can uh, have interesting results uh, even on existing uh, noisy small scale uh, uh, quantum uh, quantum hardware. So I think uh, AI is not only sort of a part of, uh, of the picture and uh, must be integrated um, uh, in, into it. It's actually probably the most productive application right now. So all the uh, many models uh, we consider in our book, uh, many algorithms we describe um, in a very detailed way in our book, actually belong to the class of uh, quantum machine learning algorithms, uh, which we can test either on existing noisy hardware or on efficient uh, quantum simulators. Mm. Maybe just to add one thing. Uh, yeah, please. I think there's something, it's very interesting the way the question is phrased, and I think that's important, is, is that I don't think quantum should be an alternative to AI or other methods. It's really about integration and quantum computing as a as a tool i think there were there were some questions about it uh, in the chat as a you know hybrid version so it's a tool that combined with other classical tools you know deep neural network and so on will actually provide new solutions and it's really about integration and you know hybrid system rather than no oh, quantum is a completely different thing and completely different path yeah uh, jack interesting that you would go to uh point uh, answer this one because this is actually a three-part question uh, there are three different comments i'll just read it out to you uh, the first part asks which frameworks kiss kit bracket does the book use is the second part so, okay okay which which frameworks do we use in the book is it kiss kit or bracket and then the second part is this also do you look at hybrid high performance computing plus quantum or tpu gpu and QPU. So, I mean, on the the actual implementation side, so the book is not about, so we, you know, it's not a computer science book, right? So we don't have a huge, uh, you know, bits of code in the book. I think at the personal level, when we teach the corresponding course in Imperial, or when for our own research, we use some languages, and now there are actually several competing languages, whether you know it's Qiskit or Bracket or Penny Lane. Uh, there are quite a few which are competing. So you know, I don't want to uh, to go into you know, support one or the other. I don't have any shares in any of them, uh, <laughs> and they're all very performing uh, on their own uh, side. Uh, but the book does not really take uh, take sides on which language for what, because yeah, it is language agnostic. Yes. So there is an interesting question by someone on YouTube. In fact, uh, they are developing a machine learning model development and finance to forecast future analysis product. Uh, how much is this book usable for them? Alexei, do you want to... um, Well, well uh, I would say that at, at the moment uh, when we uh, when we do uh, experiments with various um, uh, ML models, uh, inevitably all these uh, models, all these use cases, um, um, they deal with relatively small scale problems. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Partially because existing quantum hardware, NISC hardware, has at most uh, 100 qubits. I, th I think uh, recent development uh, actually uh, went above 100 qubits, but uh, 
most quantum chips uh, we can we can have access to has about 100 qubits uh, and uh, quantum simulators obviously uh, being classical cannot simulate more than say 50 60 qubits uh, then we start running out of memory so um, we can experiment on the very wide range of very interesting problems but they are still experiments because they're small scale mm. uh, and it's important to understand this uh, it's not about uh, uh, sort of productionizing uh, algorithms and tools right now and start uh, solving big scale problems uh, for a lot of data and you know that would require uh, hundreds thousands maybe millions of qubits we are not there yet we are at the stage when we can test a wide range of algorithms on very interesting problems and there are a lot of interesting problems which we can formulate in a way that can be addressed by tools of quantum machine learning hmm. uh, but i think it's uh, it's it's too early uh, to try and uh, you know to sort of embed uh, uh, quantum computing into sort of day-to-day -day, uh, you know, business processes. Yeah, maybe, maybe to add one little thing there, even if you look on the, let's call it classical machine learning or classical neural networks, um, suppose you try to do classification problem, which you can ask the question to both academics and practitioners, which neural network is the best? Should you have five layers, 10 layers, 20 nodes, 100 nodes? Every, you know, you can, uh, you can do that in the comments in the chat. I'm pretty sure everyone will have a different answer. Uh, why? Because, you know, we don't have a, we have, of course, a much better understanding now, but not, a, not full understanding. And I think quantum neural network, we have a similar, you can say type of problems, which is, how expressive are they? How, so expressive in the sense, what kind of complex functions or complex problems are we able to express with a quantum neural network? So we have very similar questions, actually. So for, even for small scale problems, there are questions that you know we could say, oh yes, I'm, I'm gonna have a classical neural network with 100 layers and 200 nodes, but then it becomes untrainable. Uh, so we would have a smaller one, but what's the best one? Uh, and, the quantum neural network side, um, we have actually very similar questions. And to f there's a very nice correspondence between the classical neural networks and quantum neural networks, which still needs to be understood uh, precisely. So in the end, depending on your, I would say, application and what you want to exactly use it for, some quantum neural network can actually be extremely useful, as useful as classical machine learning. Of course, if your problem is extremely high uh, in a high dimension, the quantum hardware, quantum technology is not there yet. But for a smaller scale problem, we already have a certain number of tools that are quite powerful. Thanks. But it is a good start if you were to see because quantum is only getting stronger. Uh, so FilmZale actually has a query on LinkedIn what are the intermediate use cases of quantum and retail banks at the moment? Uh, well, I, I would say that um, as a whole range of um, uh, discriminative models, um, classifiers, it can be um, uh, as, as simple as um, credit decisions. Should we extend a credit to a particular customer or should we mm -hmm. not? Um, all sorts of uh, binary uh, binary decisions are very natural in this regard. Even uh, very simple uh, quantum neural networks uh, can be trained uh, very efficiently. And actually on reasonably large data sets uh, with a reasonably large number of features. Uh, it doesn't have to be a binary classification problem. It can be multi-class classification problem, still works, and it can be efficiently trained. Um, so I would say uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, well-specified, well-defined classification problem um, places advantage of uh, uh, quantum neural network in retail space. Uh, mm -hmm. For, uh, say, investment banks, uh, for uh, clones working um, 
uh, with um, uh, with traders uh, and uh, with dealing with uh, complex mathematical models, com complex problems, uh, maybe generative models would be better. Uh, for example, uh, market generators, the ability to generate synthetic market data with desired characteristics, because uh, as Jack mentioned, uh, there is a lot of research going on uh, how to uh, measure and estimate expressive power of quantum neural networks relative to classical neural networks. And we know already that uh, there are theoretical results uh, stating that uh, um, quantum uh, neural networks have exponentially larger expressive power in comparison with classical ones, comparable classical neural networks. So it, it means that we can learn a very complex distributions. We can encode very complex probability distributions in, in, in the state uh, of this tiny quantum mechanical system from which we can generate samples. By measuring the state, we would generate samples from the encoded uh, probability distribution. And uh, in investment banking space, uh, when uh, we have problems of um, uh, running all sorts of Monte Carlo simulation or generally uh, generating a lot of synthetic data, market synthetic market data, uh, then powerful generative model would be very useful. And here we also see a uh, big potential for uh, 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 generative uh, QML models. So, uh, Alexi, it's quite good to hear that uh, you can work with a lot of complex problems with quantum uh, and quantum machine learning. Uh, what about the accuracy levels? How is it better or how does it compare uh, when you take traditional machine learning versus quantum machine yeah. learning? Uh, this is a great question. And th this is why in our book, we always provide uh, classical benchmarks. In, mm -hmm. in our book, we cover the whole range of models, uh, discriminative, generative. We have optimization problems. And every time... Uh, we use uh, is actual quantum hardware or a quantum simulator. We, we run experiments, we produce results, uh, we measure performance. We always uh, provide a classical benchmark. We always yeah. uh, specify the most suitable equivalent uh, classical machine learning model or classical uh, um, uh, optimization algorithm. And we measure performance of both on the same problem with the same input. And uh, what, what we know is that uh, as long as uh, problems are relatively small in size, uh, QML models perform at least as good as classical models. Sometimes uh, we, we can see some first signs of em emerging quantum advantage. Uh, for example, uh, in some cases we can, uh, we can detect uh, noticeable uh, quantum speed up if we ignore all sorts of uh, uh, overheads. Uh, uh, but the transition to large scale problems will have to wait until we sort of catch up on technological development on hardware side. Uh, but from purely a sort of computational, mathematical, if you wish, or computer science point of view, we do uh, demonstrate that uh, QML forms at least as well as classical ml hmm. okay. all right so i think uh jack you can take this one we are almost on track to answer the second question because we were talking about optimization and uh the sig significant advantages so dan on youtube has inquired can you give an example of finance problem where quantum computer um, mm -hmm. computation at the current level of hardware implementation would provide a significant advantage. Yes. So maybe just one little thing. There are two, I mean, problems or tools, right? One is machine learning and one is optimization. And the two are kind of very different objects. So what we're saying about, you know, not yet in production, I think this is true for quantum machine learning. The quantum optimization, there are already some success stories at, uh, you know, for a high dimensional problem. Uh, D-Wave, for example, has been around for actually uh, a long time and has solved, so I would say very few in finance so far, but quite a few in other industries, uh, large dimensional problems. 
uh, with actually very good results. Uh, so of course we are focusing on the finance side here, but we we might and we should actually learn from you know other success stories in other industries, uh, especially on the quantum optimization side, on quantum annealing side. Um, so right now, so to answer, I mean this particular question about current at the current level of hardware implementation. So I would say optimization actually could pro could provide an advantage. So I think it depends on what kind of optimization. Uh, portfolio optimization, simple portfolio optimization could be, uh, but we have actually very powerful tools already. Um, my feeling is at the current level, it's mostly on the quantum machine learning side. Um, and I would say one, and there's still not, no, not a complete agreement, but, but that quantum neural networks provide a lot more expressivity than classical neural networks, even on a small scale. Thing. So for example, when it comes to, um, so there are, there's a branch of uh, quantitative finance these days about pricing and uh, calibration of stochastic models using deep learning algorithms. And for these, you don't need actually very deep neural network uh, neural networks with just a couple of layers and not too many nodes seem to be sufficient. And so for this, for example, I believe that quantum neural networks would provide actually a very strong uh, alternative uh, because they seem to provide a lot more expressivity. That said, there's no clear result yet. It's, uh, it's a big area of research these days. And I think that's what the, the book aims at looking at, which is uh, to, pr to provide the content, to provide the background and some directions for this to actually uh, be studied more. So let's come back to LinkedIn. And Hitesh has a good question over here. Uh, which is an effective tool to amalgamate quantum computing with neural networks uh, in terms of hardware and software? And what is the recommendation of it? Um, uh, uh, Jack mentioned uh, many uh, quantum uh, SDKs. Uh, mm -hmm. Case kit, um, bracket, uh, we can mention forest and, and, and many others. Uh, in, in our book, we, uh, we always stress that we don't have preference for any quantum uh, software or any quantum hardware. We don't try to predict who is going to be the eventual winner, uh, which, uh, which which tool is better. It's it's a matter of taste a little bit. Um, however, uh, I, I would say that uh, to to probably to some extent, uh, Qiskit uh, is um, is one of the most popular tools. Um, uh, and even in, in our book, we uh, when we mention uh, numerical results, very often. We obtained these results uh, by running experiments on quantum simulators using Qiskit. So on Qiskit quantum simulators, uh, using uh, sort of, uh, programs uh, with uh, Qiskit uh, formalism and, and so on. So uh, and uh, here I think uh, I, I cannot uh, <clears throat> I cannot not to mention yet another book published by Pact, uh, the Dancing with Qubits uh, by Rob Sutter. Uh, which is also an excellent introduction to quantum computing. Um, so I, I, th I think uh, if, if, if you want to have like full range of books, uh, um, uh, looking at, at this subject from different angles, but converging in this point of quantum computing, neural networks, machine learning, then it would be probably Dancing with Qubit. Uh, by uh, Rob Salter, it would be Python Machine Learning by Sebastian Rashka and, uh, and our book, of course. I think this is a query that we're going to get time and again. What are the tools and components used in this book? And I think it's it would be a good thing to clarify it for everyone. Yeah. So, on the, so on the math side, fundamentally most of the book is so the book if you have you know a decent undergraduate in math 
you can read the book. And actually the first chapter records all the all the tools you need. So the book is really self-contained. Um, so on the math side, it's really mostly linear algebra. Uh, on the programming side, it, we mostly, so in the application, we use Qiskit. Um, and then the rest is, so optimization, which, you know, is basic, I would say, you know, basic optimization. So uh, least square regression, and that kind of problems and uh, neural networks again we recall the basics of neural networks but in order to understand that you don't need you don't need a phd in math um so there's really on the math quantitative side a good background in general math or physics um of course some knowledge of finance can be useful if you want to to understand a bit more, but we, you know, again, the book is self-contained, so I think um, we explain that properly. And and on the quantum computing side, so there are bits, you know, a bit, a bit about the quantum hardware, for example, or how do you map your problem to a particular graph of a uh, quantum hardware. But all this is actually explained in the book. So yeah. And uh, does the book cover? Monte Carlo simulations. So, we, so the title of the book uh, is Quantum Machine Learning and Optimization in Finance. Right. So it does not mention Monte Carlo. It does not mention the kind of, I would say, classical quantum algorithms like quantum Fourier transform, quantum phase estimation. The reason is that there are already some very good books on, for example, quantum information theory uh about quantum classical i would say quantum algorithms we added a final chapter uh with a bit of quantum monte carlo actually so this is covered but i would say this is not the main focus of the book um the reason is that we believe that quantum monte carlo for example even though theoretically there's a clear speed up and we highlight it in, in this chapter in the final chapter, the technology is not there yet. Yet is not there yet to really benefit from it. So, yes, it's covered. We provide the, the mathematics. So actually, this chapter is a bit more math technical than uh, some others. But we provide the details. But we do not uh, look at the actual um, application and the practical side of it. It's kind of an overture, if you wish to uh, what if we had an actual full quantum computer. OK, there is another follow up. And so both I'll quickly answer this for you. Uh, you can head on to Amazon, our website, Pact, or yeah, mobile app. OK, yeah, you can have a look at all of these places. And yeah, you will find a book. So yeah. And so there is a question from Omkar. And can you give some examples in finance where quantum annealers have advantage over classical algorithms? Uh, probably I can start answering this, this question. Uh, in, in our book, in uh, chapter number three, we look at uh, one particular use case, which is uh, a discrete portfolio optimization, a very well known and be hard uh, combinatorial optimization problem. Uh, which is uh, a hard problem for classical computers, but appears to be um, uh, very natural. It lends itself, itself naturally uh, to be addressed with quantum annealing. It can be formulated as a Cuba problem, quadratic and constrained binary optimization problem, uh, mm -hmm. which is exactly the type of uh, problems solvable in quantum annealers. Um, and our results, our numerical results, uh, our ex actual experiments, actual uh, quantum hardware on uh, D-Wave 2000Q uh, quantum annealer uh, uh, demonstrate uh, two to three orders of magnitude quantum speed up relative to e equivalent uh, classical um, uh, approach. However, uh, we should also remember that um, it's it's very hard to 
to provide a direct comparison between uh, classical computers and quantum computers because these computers have different overheads in terms of how data is stored, extracted, uh, processed. Uh, but if you, if you concentrate only on computation, on purely computational part, then um, results that were obtained uh, actually uh, four years ago already demonstrated two to three orders of magnitude uh, speed up, quantum speed up. Since then, uh, the wave uh, released uh, a new quantum chip. Uh, they moved from old Chimera graph to new Pegasus graph with much better connectivity, with lower noise, better controls. So I think um, it, it shows us a direction of travel. Even four years ago, from purely computational perspective, we demonstrated experimentally uh, material quantum speed up. Uh, I'm sure that if you would run the same experiment now on the new chip, we would probably add another order of magnitude a quantum speed up. And who knows what uh, will happen in the next three to five years. So I think uh, um, my main message is that let's look at the direction of travel. And we notice material improvements in quantum hardware every year. Every year, if not every month, we have some uh, breakthroughs, sometimes minor, sometimes major, uh, but it all, always moves in the same direction. So what uh, was uh, two to three orders of magnitude quantum speed up years ago will be absolutely mm -hmm. sort of amazing uh, just a few short years from now. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an important question over here by Bita as well. Uh, how much of your book can help the researchers to deal with the problem of covariance, matrix estimation, and portfolio optimization? Would you uh, like to take the So, okay, I can say one thing, but uh, Alex I knows this topic better than I do. I would, to me, the quantum part really is for the optimization side, where, as we said, you know, quantum annealing, for example, brings something. Covariance matrix estimation. I don't, I don't see the quantum part there, uh, and I would say one one reason is we haven't uh, really touched upon that yet, but one big bottleneck about with quantum computing yet, as much as I support quantum computing, of course, is to encode classical data into quantum data. Uh, and this is a bottleneck. So covariance matrix estimation, you know, building a covariance matrix uh, from data, this can be done very efficiently using classical tools, and this is not too hard. Uh, the quantum part will really benefit the actual optimization side. Yeah, and and uh, I also would like to mention uh, one model uh, um, described in our book, which is uh, quantum semi-definite programming, uh, that it, uh, doesn't deal directly with the covariance matrix estimation, uh, right? Uh, because the way we construct covariance matrix from the underlying financial data, typically from some time series. Is well defined, and um, I think it, it, it is not a problem to build the covariance matrix. However, uh, the biggest problem in uh, portfolio optimization is instability of covariance matrix. Sometimes a small noise around uh, estimator or covariance matrix would result in totally different uh, optimal portfolio. So uh, there is a task of performing. Uh, first, uh, robust portfolio construction, and secondly, maximum risk analysis on covariance metrics. And uh, both these problems can be efficiently addressed uh, with uh, a tool called uh, quantum semi-definite programming. And this is uh, very well described in our book. Uh, so we have the whole section on uh, quantum semi-definite programming. Hmm. Uh, Alexi and Jack, before we move ahead, I think we are Half, uh, way past the halfway mark, we should actually do at least a first giveaway. And it would be a shame if we don't do that and do both of them together. Uh, so let's do our first one first. 
as you can see, there are 49 people who entered the draw. And yeah, I'll just go ahead and click the draw. So this is randomly doing it. My hands are here. I'm not the one picking it. So Thomas Nee is the first winner. Uh, congratulations, Thomas. Uh, as you can see your name on the screen. So if you can just contact me on LinkedIn, just drop me a message on LinkedIn. And I'll be more than happy to organize your e-copy for you. Congratulations, Thomas. We'll come back to it towards the end where we pick the second winner if uh, yeah, please continue adding your messages and into the raffle and we'll do that later. So there is an interesting query here by Raphael. And Raphael inquires, what are your thoughts about interceptions between, is that interceptions here? Yeah. Interceptions between quantum machine learning in finance, quantum economy, seen from the David Earl point of view, and quantum finance. Yes, so okay, maybe I can start with that. But uh, so first of all, you know, as we mentioned uh, in the beginning, I don't think there's a clear terminology yet as to what quantum finance uh, means, or whether it's quantum finance, quantum computing, and finance, financial quantum. There's a whole mismatch, mix match of uh, mismatch of words. Uh, so. The quantitative, the, sorry, the quantum finance book by Bernard Blackie. So this is, if I remember correctly, this is about quantum field theory applied to finance, which is, in my view, completely different from quantum computing. Uh, of course, there's you know, a common background about quantum mechanics, but this is actually a very different take. Uh, and it's not really about computing. Quantum computing, as the word suggests, is about computing. Uh, the now the other one the quantum economy i haven't read it uh, yet so uh, that i can't uh, i can't say much but maybe alexei has uh... Uh, i i agree with jack i think uh, we have to be very careful uh, when we deal with uh, this new emerging terminology uh, and uh, to me uh, quantum finance actually uh, relates not to quantum computing or definitely doesn't relate to computation it's maybe because it's maybe related to um, application of uh, well-established physical models uh, in a different context uh, to, to economy to complex uh, systems uh, um, to, um, sort of um, quite orthogonal uh, to, uh, to what our, our book uh, covers yeah Okay, so we've almost answered quite a few queries uh, in the comments. So if you have any more, please feel free to add. Uh, until we do that, let me ask one of the queries that I have in my mind. So uh, Alexi, Jack, feel free to answer this, whoever would like to pick this up. What is the best approach for an organization uh, looking to test the water with quantum financial modeling? What should be the best approach for them? So it's I think it's it's a story a story of my life right okay. uh, because I was actually part of an organization in, um, at my previous place uh, which was then a chartered bank we actually faced exactly the same uh, dilemma if you wish uh, given a lot of interest to quantum computing and understanding of the potential of quantum computing uh, how would a big organization, large international bank, uh, deal with this? How can we get involved and what what should we do? Uh, and, and the answer was, uh, I think, quite universal and applicable across industries and uh, across uh, businesses, uh, large and small. Uh, first, uh, we need to understand uh, that uh, we, we just we, we cannot afford to do nothing, right? We just uh, cannot wait for 10 years until quantum hardware matures and uh, and then uh, start uh, playing the catch-up uh, game, uh, hiring very expensive consultants uh, and paying uh, for expensive uh, platforms, expensive systems, and, and generally being left behind. It's much better uh, to join 
an emerging quantum computing ecosystem as an equal partner. Uh, because whether a business is large or small, doesn't really matter as long as this business uh, can bring interesting use cases. And what uh, we collectively uh, uh, discovered was the fact that uh, quantum hardware manufacturers and quantum software development companies, they're very much interested in interesting, practical, real world use cases. And it's, it's not, it doesn't require a lot of investment. Sometimes it doesn't require any investment uh, to actually join forces with uh, academic institutions, uh, with uh, quantum hardware manufacturers, uh, with quantum software development companies in order to build uh, models, to test models on real world practical use cases, uh, do classical benchmarking, uh, provide feedback, uh, see how it, how it can potentially be integrated in uh, business processes, maybe not now, but several years down the line. And I think uh, this is uh, this is a way to get involved. Uh, and I, I, I think uh, companies who are not doing this, they're definitely missing big time because there is a very clear and very material first mover advantage. And mm -hmm. it, I think it's worth remembering uh, the stories of uh, classical digital computing, which emerged in 1950s, uh, then internet, uh, which emerged in 1990s, and uh, we, we can actually see uh, who benefited most, and we can uh, we can potentially even quantify the first move advantage here. So I think it it would definitely be a shame not to get involved uh, at, at this stage very early in, in the game. Yeah, so just to add up on this, uh, I think there's there's a difference now and five years ago, six years ago. Uh, I would say five, six years ago, Alexei was uh, pretty much the only one uh, in a bank uh, doing quantum-related uh, computations, let's say. Uh, I think now there is at least, at least a general understanding that there is a new technology with hardware not fully not full hardware yet but some 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 hardware which might bring some clear advantage uh, and i think there's a clear understanding there and in fact over the past couple of years most major banks have appointed a couple of people as head of quantum computing or developing an internal quantum computing group where the, the goal is basically to develop some use cases and to see how they perform compared to classical technologies. And I mean, now, you know, pulling the blanket a bit towards me, I think there's clearly something to do. Uh, Alexei mentioned it as more interaction between companies and, and academia. Uh, and so, for example, you know, we have strong students uh, who know math, who know statistics, you can code very well, and who actually know the basics of quantum computing, mm. who, who can actually spend six months in a company implementing some use case, implementing a quantum neural network for classification, implementing a, qu a quantum annealing tool for optimization. So I think one way to do it, I understand that a company is not going to hire 10 people full time to to switch everything to quantum production, right? But to develop some use cases, to have more partnerships actually with academia uh, and with, of course, with the quantum computing companies to, uh, to start building and uh, ensure that we need the technology is already there, or part of it is already there, and we can already build some use cases. Right. So receive a question from a colleague of mine internally so let me do one thing let me post it here and then share it on screen so that everyone can see it there so yeah so how do noisy intermediate scale quantum computers make quantum modeling more accessible uh, well, maybe i will start answering okay. uh, this yeah. question uh, we already touched on this uh, on this point. Uh, NISC uh, computers um, um, sort of 
prevent us from running some uh, what what we call classical quantum algorithms uh, because uh, for, for uh, a factorization problem and uh, some search problems we need uh, much higher quality quantum hardware uh, but NISC uh, computers can be used for experiments on a number of quantum machine learning problems which uh, and uh, because there are some uh, uh, some algorithms some methods which are somewhat uh, resistant to noise and, uh, and in, in our book we look at several such uh, such methods uh, such algorithms one is a variational quantum eigen solver um, and uh, to some extent even uh, uh, quantum neural networks are uh, uh, noise resistance uh, in in some case one can argue that some uh, residual noise present in quantum hardware plays the same role as artificially injected noise in classical uh, machine learning when we add noise when we train quantum neural network in order to prevent overfitting and improve convergence so i think um, uh, right now we are trying to play to the strengths of quantum hardware uh, so i i think we can probably ref reformulate the statement this question it's uh, it's not that NISC uh, computers help us to do something, it's that we uh, deliberately choose problems, use cases uh, that are solvable or uh, problems that can be run on NISC computers. So we're trying to play to the strengths of the hardware. Mm. Okay. So let's take one last query because I can't see any more and then we'll do our final draw. So. Alexi, uh, sorry, Jack, do you want to take this up? Will quantum computing bring an end to internet security? Sure. Uh, well, sure. <laughs> I'm happy to take it. Uh, not sure as uh, <laughs> the answer. Uh, no, that's my answer. And I mean, the reason is you could say, you know, if, uh, if code breaker have a, have a very high performing even say classical computer, people who encode, you know, the data also have a better computer. So it's a bit like a two player game. Sure, you know, if I encode my data, but I only do it classically, and you're trying to break my code and you have a full quantum computer, yes, I lost the game. But the reality is, oh, I, I also, if you have a quantum computer, then I probably have one as well. So, you know, it's a cat and mouse game. And in some sense, it's not, in my view, related to the to quantum computer or classical computer. In the sense that, yes, a quantum computer, if when we have a full version, yes, it will break the current versions of, you know, encoding or encrypting, but you know, we will encrypt and encode uh, in a different way if we have a quantum computer. Um, it's, you know, same as these, uh, you know, generative adversarial network or the quantum version where you have, you know, a counterfeiter and, um, well, you know, where two players improve each other by, by, by fighting against each other. So I think it would bring, bring an end to classical internet security but not to internet security. Mm, fair enough. Okay, so let's move on to the last draw for the evening before we end the session. Uh, all right, I'll just put the screen up. There it is. So Thomas, you were the first winner. Congratulations for that. Please get in touch with me on LinkedIn uh, and I'll organize your free e-copy for you. So let's see who the second winner is. All the best, everyone. And Sarah Marzella, congratulations, Sarah. So, Sarah, please get in touch with me on LinkedIn or Alexi and Jack, if you know them, and I'll organize your copy for you. Congratulations to both the winners. And thanks a lot for everyone for their time. And yeah. Hope to see you soon. We have another episode next week. Sorry, Jack, you were saying something. 
Yeah, may I just uh, add yes. one one tiny thing? Well, two things actually I wanted to add. One yes, is as a personal take on on all this. I think quantum mm -hmm. computing, whether you come from math, from stats, from physics, from computing, I think it's a really exciting field because to me it's actually the first time where we actually have a, a field which is fully interdisciplinary. Uh, and over the past three years, and I'm building a, we're building a big group in Imperial, for example, with people from physics, from electrical engineering, from aeronautics, from math, from, I don't know what I forgot, computing, physics, and, uh, and also with industry, whether it's finance, whether it's uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, of course, quantum computing uh, companies as well. So it's a really, truly interdisciplinary field, which is really exciting and something really new to build upon. It's not just, oh, I'm solving a problem for the next three months. It's really to have a much, you know, further away vision. And the other thing is, I mean, there's, uh, you know, thank you very much for setting that up. Of course, if, if anyone has any particular question or want to know more, or want to discuss more, uh, we're happy to, you know, I'm happy to receive emails and discuss that by email. Uh, yeah. And also just to inform everyone, inside the book, there is a QR code uh, at the end of every chapter. Uh, you can join the Discord community. Uh, we have around 2,300 people on that community now. If you have any queries about the book, about quantum computing in general, or machine learning in general, in general, you can join the community and ask us queries. And uh, Alexi and Jack are a part of the community as well. There are other experts in there, and everyone will be more than happy to answer your questions for you and be a part of your learning journey. So Alexi, you've been quiet for a long time. Any closing comments from you? Uh, yeah, um, so my uh, closing uh, comment uh, uh, is about the fact that uh, quantum computing is a truly new technology. It's not just a new piece of software or repackaging of some uh, models, some, no. Uh, not, not, it's not yet another app or something like that. It's true new technology. It's like electronics. So when electronics appeared, it was a new technology. When uh, we started generating electricity for the first time. It was new technology. So quantum technology is a similarly new technology, uh, which uh, manifests itself in many different areas. And, and now we just started to harnessing this, this technology because now we have uh, we reached the point when we can actually do it. But we should understand that we are talking about totally new technology. And uh, quantum computing or quantum measurement uh, or uh, many other things, uh, other things, quantum, they will play progressively more important role, uh, especially as technology matures. So I think uh, it's, it's, as Jack said, it's, it's, it's extremely exciting uh, to be here at, at the very first uh, so stages of, uh, uh, of this new technology that started, just started to sort of touch our everyday life, to, to sort of penetrate our lives. Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot for your time, everyone. Just one quick thing before we go. I can't see in the LinkedIn QR code. Uh, Lampros, what you can simply do is just click on my profile and on my LinkedIn profile in my bio, there is a link. Join the MLEI community. Just click on that, as simple as it, right? So yes, thanks everyone. Alexi and Jack, I'll see you backstage. And thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.